So today's questions are taken from the guide to the Vainamunen and Ilmarinen and the brief history of naval armor. So let's get on with questions from them. What I Need a Name asks if the two Akron class airships of the US Navy did not crash, how would naval aviation be changed? And also what would be the largest gun caliber you could put on a normal airship of the time? Well, it's a little difficult to tell. I mean, I have covered this again in uh, other dry docks previously, but briefly speaking, if Akron and Macon, uh, which is apparently how you pronounce it, I don't know, um, hadn't crashed, then, well, for them not to crash would either mean they get used very differently or perhaps the design faults that contribute to their crashes don't actually happen. But for whatever... If they remain operational, then the ZRCV concept, which is basically the Akron class, except even bigger, now carrying dive bombers instead of pocket fighters, would probably be built. Um, I mean, the, the accidents with things like Hindenburg and R101, etc., would presumably still happen, so people would begin to go away from airships, um, but maybe just a little bit later. And ultimately aircraft are improving far faster than airship technology would be improving. So I don't think it would have appreciably changed all that much, but at the same time, uh, the Akrons and the theoretical ZRCVs would have been part of the US Navy's scouting force, which would, I guess, probably have been folded then into the carrier force. Quite how well four gigantic airships would have fared trying to fend off the Japanese. Um, yeah, that, that probably doesn't bear thinking about. So to be charitable, let's say they're all based on the East Coast, at which point, as I've said in a, a previous answer re regarding these ships, they would have probably been a highly useful anti-submarine escorts for convoys um, in the opening stages and middle stages of World War II. In that respect, actually, the ZRCVs, assuming that they also aren't complete disasters, would probably be even more useful because whilst the Akrons would be able to spot and strafe in enemy submarines or call in attention from escorts, the ZRCVs, by dint of carrying much heavier aircraft, namely dive bombers, would actually be able to do direct targeting, targeted attacking of the um, 
enemy submarines. Although, ironically enough, again, the Acrons with their fighter loadout might have been more useful, well, assuming that they could invent something a little bit more capable than the Sparrowhawk, but in theory, assuming that, they would have been more useful in the Central and Eastern Atlantic when it came to dealing with things like FW-200 Condors. Um, although, again, you probably don't want to get into a Condor versus Akron fight <laughs> one way or the other. I mean, it would be rather amusing, um, although probably not for the people aboard. As for the largest gun calibre you could put on a normal airship of the time, I think it depends on exactly what you're trying to do with it. If you're trying to use it as a defensive gun to fend off the attacking aircraft, then probably the largest thing you're going to be able to put on it is a lightweight 20mm cannon. Um, I don't think anything much heavier is going to be particularly favoured, especially given the sheer weight of guns goes up quite dramatically. Um, but if you're talking for some bizarre reason about some kind of air-to-ground air attack capability, I mean, the idea of uh, Akron or, or Macon hunting down a, a U-boat is quite amusing, I suppose. Um, if recoilless guns existed, I guess in theory you could stick almost any size of kind of recoilless gun that was produced on them. Um, albeit obviously with a weight penalty involved, but in theory, yeah, sort of a 75, 90 or 90 millimeter recoilless rifle could have been stuck on a gondola. I've no idea why you'd want to do that other than America, but it could be done, which probably means at some point it would have been. 4L3KS asks, would you classify the HEO class carriers as light or fleet carriers? And does the displacement usage or complement act as your deciding factor? Well, at risk of temporary stealing Matt Easton's shtick, um, context is the thing. Um, and in this particular case, the context is vital. I mean, the HEO class, for those of you who might not be uh, fully up to speed with your entire Japanese Navy carrier fleet, were a pair of originally luxury passenger liners that were then converted into aircraft carriers. Um, and they came into service with the Japanese Navy in the middle of World War II. I personally am going to move for them to be classified as fleet carriers, and that's for two reasons. One of which is air group. They've got an air group of over 50, at least in theory, so that puts them comfortably into the realm of a fleet carrier. But when you look at the rest of their statistics, again, you pretty much have to put them as fleet carriers, otherwise you're left answering some very awkward questions about what exactly is and isn't a fleet carrier. Their displacement is actually slightly greater than the illustrious class, which are definitely fleet carriers, albeit that the illustrious class is significantly better protected and more heavily armed. Um, now their speed, yes, is low. It's just over 25 knots. The illustrious, for example, is capable of over 30. But then there are a number of fleet carriers, or at least things that people classified as fleet carriers, like, say, HMS Eagle, that were about that speed, or carriers like Carga that weren't massively faster. And, I mean, with Eagle and Carga, certainly no one at the time thought of them as not fleet carriers, and in uh, Eagle's case, it's aircraft complement, displacement, and speed were all less than uh, Heo. So, you, you, if you, it's, yeah, I think it basically comes down to that. In the context of ships available at the time, they were aircraft carrier uh, fleet carriers. Now, granted, they may not have been the biggest and largest and meanest fleet carriers around, but they certainly would, were fleet carriers. Now, if they'd been introduced into service two, three years later, then you could probably make an argument that they're light fleet carriers, but even in that period at sort of 1944-45, where you have the light fleet carrier, the Majestic class um design which we've covered in a five minute guide granted they are fractionally smaller and significantly lighter than the heos but similar sized air groups similar speed still called light fleet carriers i don't think there's any real argument for them be for the heos being designated as purely light carriers will rogers asks a ship versus ship question in a one-on-one -on -one duel between a Sharnhorst class as commissioned and a congo class uh post refit uh, in the 1930s, who would be the winner? 
So we're going with as commissioned because, well, I think he's uh, rather suspecting that as the war goes on and Scharnhorst gets better and better radar, it becomes more and more in its favour. But to be perfectly honest, the battle's pretty much in Scharnhorst's favour, even in this scenario. Notice the uh, the non-Atlantic Bell Scharnhorst down there. Um, and that is because of protection. Speed-wise, the Scharnhorst and the refitted Congos near enough as makes no difference are the same. Gun-wise, fair enough, the Congo class have bigger guns. They have 14-inch guns in, in the four twin turrets as opposed to the 9-11 inch guns in on the Scharnhorsts. However, when it comes to protection, there's two entirely different ballparks. Um, Sean Horst's belt is almost but not quite 14 inches thick with okay-ish deck armor. It's not fantastic, but um, it's better than nothing. Um, now, granted, Congo's deck armor is slightly thicker, but its belt armor um, wasn't really improved. People say the Congos were refitted to fast battleships. Mm, I, I tend to doubt that, personally. They certainly were the fast part of that. The battleship part, not so much. They didn't have any major upgrade in their guns, um, beyond the standard incremental upgrades in shell quality, etc. And their belt armour is no better than the British uh, Lion-class battlecruisers at Jutland, and indeed in some... In, large parts is actually even thinner. Now, whilst the main belt armour of said battlecruisers at Jutland was able to mo pretty much mostly deal with incoming German 11-inch and 12-inch gunfire, the 11-inch guns on a Scharnhorst are very different from the 11-inch guns that were present at Jutland. They have substantially better armour penetration capability. And so at the most likely battle ranging of engagement, which was probably going to be anything from 15,000, 16,000 up to maybe 22, 24,000 yards, albeit obviously you do have Sean Horse ridiculously long range shot against Glorious, but that is not really a, that's an outlier for a reason. It's not really representative of general combat. But in that, say, 15 to 24 or even 25,000 yard engagement bracket, the Congos don't have an immune zone against Sean Horst's guns. And at that range, the guns are gonna the shell's gonna almost certainly be hitting the belt rather than the deck. Whereas Sean Horst's much thicker armor does have a relatively substantial immune zone against the Congo's guns at that kind of range. Now obviously that is broadside on 90 degrees perpendicular, which is a little bit artificial. But that doesn't actually help the Congos all that much because if Sean Horst is at any kind of slight angle, its immune zone grows slightly larger and Congo would basically have to be going in a near enough head-on to get its armour into a position where it has a meaningful immune zone against Sean Horst guns. So purely on the basis of the Sean Horst is going to be able to take an awful lot more hits than the Congo, I'm going to give it to the Sean Horst because the Shan Horse can hurt the Congo at practical battle ranges in areas, and very vital areas, where the Congo can't do the same to the Shan Horse until the battle gets to stupid close range. Breedley asks, are there any different designations for pre-dreadnought battleships going between the first Ironclad and the first pre-dreadnought? Oh yeah, well... <laughs> At the time, no. <laughs> uh, at the time, everything was ironclads or rams, depending on exactly which decade you were in. Um, or ironclad rams, if you wanted to be really clever. Within the more technical side of things, as opposed to the, the shorthand and the pop culture um, of the period, yes, there were plenty of different designations. So, broadly speaking... <laughs> Because this is probably the period of naval history where there's the most variation in design. Along what you might see as the main line of development, you had the broadside ironclad, which is pretty self-explanatory, kind of like an age of sail ship, except now with iron. You had the central battery ironclad, which was similar to a broadside ironclad, except that 
you had fewer main guns in the hull, usually larger and all concentrated, shockingly enough, in a central battery, quite often with sponsons, um, especially on French ships, in order to enable a head and a stern fire. You then had masted turret ships, which, again, th these designations are pretty easy to work out. It's, it's a ship with a turret that also has masts. <laughs> then you have mastless turret ships, which, again, fairly self-explanatory. Then you have barbette ships, and then you have the fully armoured barbette ship, which basically turns into the pre-dreadnought. Along the line, you also have, obviously, monitors. Uh, you have breastwork monitors designed for uh, ocean-going operations. You have armoured rams. You have abominations unto the Lord. And you have the hotels. So, And you have this thing, which apparently was put together out of spare parts. Um, but if, if at least if you go by looks. So, yes... There, there is a lot of weird and wonderful stuff, but that first list is probably the, the main one you're probably thinking about. Eric24567 asks, Just wondering, what's the rough estimate of hits and misses in a naval gunfight? I'm guessing different eras have vastly different accuracy, but do you have any ideas? Um, the short answer is that there is no one answer, <laughs> basically. The long answer is there's so many variables that affect things. Broadly speaking, you can say that actually, weirdly enough, the levels of hit, sort of the hit to mit ratio was actually better in a lot of Age of Sail battles, but then that was largely down to Age of Sail gun range under a decent captain being so close you can't possibly miss. Um, rather than, in most cases, any kind of particular aiming skills beyond, well, the ships in front of us, or, or at least in front of the guns. It did drop off significantly during the development of ironclad and then later pre-dreadnought warships. At some battles... It was very high, again, because Iron Armour gave people the confidence and, indeed, in some cases, the need to get right up close. Uh, but as soon as ranges started opening up, as rangefinder technology, for the most part during that era, up to about the mid-1900s, was lagging behind the ability of guns to reach out and hit things, the accuracy was pretty low. Um, I mean, if you look at various engagements in the Spanish-American War... Even on the side that won by actually hitting something, that being the American side, the accuracy levels were still abysmal. In some of the engagements, the accuracy level was below 1%, and some calibers of guns scored no hits whatsoever. And, yeah, the Spanish side was even worse. The Battle of Tsushima wasn't quite that bad, but it was still, for the number of shells fired, the accuracy was still pretty terrible. It was still sort of sub 1% to up to maybe between 1% and 3% for most ships. But there were a few variations on that. The main problem is the amount of equipment, the training, and the weather conditions could be so variable from ship to ship that everything goes a little bit out the window. Because when you get into larger engagements, let's say World War One, things can be a bit all over the shop. So if you look at BT's battle cruisers, for example, at Jutland, they rightly get a lot of stick for not hitting all that much. Their uh, accuracy rate is actually terrible. But the accompanying 5th Battle Squadron's accuracy rate is quite a bit better. Um, so quite a lot of the time you see this thing up about, oh yes, well, German accuracy at Jutland was brilliant, British accuracy at Jutland was terrible. No. BT's battle cruisers were terrible. The German first scouting group had a greater accuracy hit rate than Beatty's battle cruisers, but that's not a very high bar to clear. Um, you then got the German high seas fleet, but when you consider the other constituent, major constituent parts of the British fleet that were there, namely Fifth Battle Squadron, Third Battle Cruiser Squadron, and the Grand Fleet, all of those actually had better gunnery in terms of hit percentages than the Germans first scouting group. And 
most of them also had better a better hit ratio than the high seas fleet which you might think is a bit odd given the sort of the pop culture and the memes that go around about that battle but it is what it is but again it ranges bt's battle cruisers are struggling depending on some of the ships struggling to even clear that one two percent mark the same way that the u.s navy and the spanish navy were failing to do in the spanish american war but it goes up to sort of four five six percent for some of the other units that were mentioned and then you have the real outliers like hms iron duke which got 14 percent hit ratio which is practically unheard of in any naval engagement world war one world war two or later um if you just put the statistics for iron duke down without saying who had who had done it and when most people would accuse you of making that level of hit rate up <laughs> because even radar guided guns in in the second world war in battleship engagements didn't get that lucky um and the same thing in the second world war to be perfectly honest um obviously hood hit nothing um, Prince of Wales' accuracy at Denmark Strait actually wasn't awful in terms of uh, shells fired versus hits scored. Um, and then Bismarck, obviously, in that battle did score hits. Then in its next major battle didn't. And it, it seesaws back and forth. It even seesaws back and forth on ships. Exeter, for example, even though it's having, sort of, it's having six shades of hell beaten out of it by Graf Spey actually has a pretty decent level of gun accuracy with its 8-inch guns. Weirdly enough, once it's been refitted with radar and it ends up fighting at the Battle of Java Sea, its accuracy goes way down. Um, go figure. Um, and likewise, uh, say something with something like USS Salt Lake City, uh, which was one of the Pensacola class. In some battles, it scored a very good hit ratio. In other battles, it basically hit nothing. So, unfortunately, that's the long way of saying there isn't really a rough estimate. Even even for an individual ship, you can't really guess. You can only take very large averages across entire conflicts for a particular navy. And even then, that's only going to give you a, a remote idea of what, what might be statistically possible. Lee Ward asks, how dismal was the state of the Soviet fleet that they were afraid of going against Finland? Um, <laughs> well, if you've watched the uh, video on the Baltic campaign in 1990, 1920, you might have some idea. Uh, the, the Soviet Red Fleet, for a long period of time, was very definitely not in any way shape or form in a state to fight much of anybody i mean this is the fleet where in the 1920s some of the edited highlights include accidentally setting fire to one of their own battleships and not being able to control it and losing the ship effectively um albeit the hulk was still there not because the magazine exploded but just because they were unable to fight the fire despite the fact the ship was moored alongside the the dock and well, obviously, is in an infinite supply of water. Um, at other points, they were seriously considering ripping old coal-fired engines out of older ships and putting replacing newer oil-fired engines with the old coal-fired ones because they had coal and people who understood how to run those and they didn't have oil and people who un understood how to run those. Um a ship that disabled itself in a running chase by firing its own main gun backwards and blowing up most of its own superstructure. Um, ships that just got flat out stolen out of nowhere. Um, the, the, the list goes on. I mean, even once they'd eliminated some of the older stuff that they'd inherited from the Imperial Russian fleet... The Soviet Red Fleet really didn't get its act together until sort of the mid 1930s, where they started doing some of the modernizations and new builds. And even then, things got horribly messed up. I mean, you just have to look at the design and development record of the Kirov class cruisers, which was probably a bad idea to start with, but yeah, and then it got worse. Yeah, so well done. You you started off trying to make a heavy cruiser with the firing rate of a light cruiser, and you've ended you end up with a ship that doesn't have the firepower of a heavy cruiser and has the rate of fire of a battleship. 
Uh, yeah, clap, clap, clap. All stand up for that one. I wonder who's getting sent to Gulag today. So yeah, the the idea of taking the Russian Baltic fleet. I think I've got that see that I see right this time. Yeah, the idea of taking the Russian Baltic fleet up against the Finns, who actually possessed a modicum of competence. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'd be worried for my life if I was a Russian sailor being asked to do that. Um, the, the Finnish Navy was effectively in a microcosm for what the Baltic Navy wanted to be only better and actually working. Lim Yu Jin asks, Can modern missiles intercept and destroy World War II era battleship rounds? And if possible, would it be by setting off the fuse or by detonating the charge? I mean, in theory, yes. Uh, they can intercept them. A 15 or 16 inch shell is a fairly substantial object. Um, it's going to certainly show up on radar and be of a kind of diameter that is similar to a small anti-shipping missile. So in that respect, sure, the systems will be able to pick it up. They go in massive ballistic arcs, so they're relatively easy to spot, relatively easy to track. They're not sea skimming or anything like that. They are coming in a fair bit faster than your average uh, sea skimming missile, unless you happen to be Russia. So there would be that problem, a sort of relatively short time of engage engagement. But there's nothing about a World War II battleship round that means you couldn't get a lock on and launch a modern surface to air missile at it. It would be an incredibly cost prohibitive way of doing things, considering that uh, a modern surface to air missile probably costs orders of magnitude more than a simple battleship shell. Um, but in terms of actually then killing the thing, that's actually going to be harder than you think. Uh, one main reason, and that is that almost all modern missiles depend on fragmentation to kill their target. So they, they sort of they fly close to, ideally in front of the target, um, and explode either in a cloud or a directed cone of shrapnel, and it's the shrapnel that tears apart the incoming projectile. If it's an aircraft, hopefully by destroying its flight surfaces, um, and if it's a missile, then, well, wrecking the flight surfaces is is still a good way to go, but also by just tearing it up, possibly detonating the fuel, um, and generally converting it into a cloud of fast-moving chaff, which slows down pretty quickly. The problem with doing that for a battleship shell is that it is going to be moving at a fair clip, which means that you're going to have to go for an ahead detonation or an intercepting detonation with a cone. Now... The shell itself is obviously designed to punch through armor plate. That means that the nose cone of the shell is going to be substantially better protected and substantially more able to stand up to shrapnel impacts as compared to a modern missile, which tends to have very sensitive electronics and other um, apparatus on the nose. So if you did get a sort of a perfect position directly in front, I'm exploding and sending a ton of shrapnel in your direction, there's a fair chance that you the shell might come through. Um, I mean, you might damage it, but you're probably not actually going to kill it. Your best way of doing it, I mean, setting off the fuse is just no. Um, extremely, extremely lucky hit, maybe. But to be honest, if you if you manage to hit... A battleship shell with a piece of shrapnel that's big enough and moving fast enough and therefore hitting hard enough to actually initiate the fuse it's probably just going to punch through and destroy the fuse mechanism without you actually having to worry about setting the fuse off um, as far as detonating the charge battleship shell explosives are well, obviously not entirely stable, but they're a little bit more stable than you might otherwise imagine for the very good reason that people don't like their own battleships exploding completely at random. Um, things like the first uh, Dreadnought type Vanguard and Mutsu notwithstanding. So just sending a bit of shrapnel into the shell probably is not likely to um, destroy it in that manner, but enough 
hot, fast-moving fragments of shrapnel maybe punching through the side of a shell probably will either detonate it or, if not detonate it, at least cause it to burn and thus decompartmentalise itself or cross the sky. So yeah, it's, it's possible, but it'll be a lot, lot harder than you might otherwise think. Um, and with the relatively limited flight time you've got for an incoming shell, if you've got something firing, say, a nine-gun salvo at you, I don't think you'd actually intercept everything, to be perfectly honest. Um, not successfully. Robert Rowe asks, which nation built in World War II built the best submarines? It depends entirely on what you define by best. If you want to go by biggest, fastest, or nastiest torpedo, then, but to the enemy, um, then probably the Japanese. If you want to go with most technologically advanced, both in terms of submarines and torpedoes deployed, probably the Germans. If you want to go with forward firepower, i.e. like torpedo salvo most likely to scare the living daylights out of anybody who's coming your way, probably the British with the T-classes, um, 10 torpedo forward spread, as demonstrated here by HMS Thorne. If you want to go with submarines that had the single greatest and most notable effect on the enemy merchant marine as a proportion of its original strength, the Americans. And similarly, if you want to go for sort of long-range, well-provisioned, highly operational um, submarines, again, the Americans with their fleet submarines. And then you've got all other sorts of things that take into account with submarines. So do you want to go with stealthiest? deepest diving, most torpedoes aboard, most effective as a as um, a gun platform if they're using deck guns, etc, etc. So it's very easy to kind of pick out a top trump style, ah, well, this one will win because of X for practically any uh, submarine building nation. I mean, heck, if you want to go with the best small scale underwater specialist submarines, it's probably going to be the Italians. Um, most uh, most heavily armed gun wise, obviously the French with Sercou. So, yeah, if we, if we, if we define best in some manner, which we is a bit more measurable, then uh, I can probably give you a better answer. <laughs> Ian nineteen fifty seven asks, is there any point in comparing the Iowa and Yamato, given that in any realistic situation they would have been deployed as part of a task force? and therefore unlikely to battle it out like boxers. In some ways, yes, and in some ways, no. Uh, I mean, a battleship, even up until the midpoint of the Second World War, was still seen as sort of the greatest accomplishment that any navy could produce. So in that respect, you can see why the comparison between Yamato and Iowa would be made, albeit that, more accurately speaking, um, if you want to go in terms of time of construction as opposed to sort of end of the line of design nature Yamato will be more properly compared with the South Dakota which um, yeah that's a little bit worrying but anyway th there is that kind of thing but also as you've probably hopefully gathered over watching various videos battleships and warships in general are so complex when it comes to considering them as massive collections of machinery and men the a one on one is already pushing it in <laughs> to try and work out who would win because there are so many factors involved. It's only when there's a very clear and decisive difference that you have uh you can e easily declare a winner. And to be perfectly fair, this kind of battleship confrontation is probably one of the few remaining opportunities where you could get some kind of one on one fight. I mean, neither navy would want that. I mean, the Jap fair enough, the Japanese might. But generally speaking, you don't want to fight fair. Yeah, there's a reason Rodney didn't go in after Bismarck alone, and there's a reason they didn't send Hood and a cruiser after Bismarck and Prince Eugen or Prince of Wales and a cruiser. No navy ever wants to fight fair. So if at all possible, yeah, fair enough. It wouldn't have been a straight one-on-one -on -one fight. But sometimes you have to take what you get. So whilst it's 
equally possible to say, well, if Yamato ever came up against Iowa, then it's going to be fighting other US warships plus airstrikes. Yes, that's fair enough. It's entirely possible that could happen. But it's also entirely possible that if it develops as some kind of task force based fleet battle, the other American ships might well be occupied with other Japanese ships that are shooting at them. And it just so happens to come down to Yamato versus Iowa in or an Iowa class in some kind of straight up gunfight for a while. And to be honest, given the amount of explosive that both sides would be slinging around and as well as how much damage that could do, I don't think that fight would last practically much longer than it would take for other ships to come and get involved. <laughs> um, it, the, one or the other side would clearly have, have won or lost the engagement by the time anyone else showed up in anything like a relatively plausible encounter. So, yeah... It's six of one and a half dozen of the other. I think that there's a case to be made where, at least for battleship one-on-ones, you can come up with some vaguely realistic scenario whereby that might happen. But at the same time, as you point out, they, they are also going to be fighting as part of fleets or task groups. And so in any given environment, what's far more likely to happen is something like, well, what happened to the original Jap- <laughs> Yamato and Musashi? Gort Yeager asks... If the British 24.5-inch torpedo had become the standard in the interwar and World War II period, how much better or worse off would the British destroyer and submarine forces have been in World War II and later on going into NATO? It really depends how they develop them, because there's precisely one 24.5-inch torpedo that was used um, in the interwar period by the British, and that's, as shown here, aboard HMS Nelson and HMS Rodney. Now... Despite being a considerably larger weapon, both in width and length, compared to the 21-inch standard torpedoes that were found in submarines and onboard destroyers and cruisers, this weapon didn't actually have that much noticeably greater a warhead. What it did have was considerably more range. Uh, This torpedo could go up to 20,000 yards in a period where quite a lot of torpedoes would struggle to reach a quarter of that and even later on in world war ii torpedoes would were still only maybe hitting about two-thirds of that distance at a slow setting um for most of them and again a lot of them were even half or less you now that particular design choice made sense for the nelson and rodney because well they were battleships designed to fight at long range and well, if you're going to have torpedo tubes, the, I guess the British decided that you should have a torpedo that could fight at something approaching that kind of range. If the, this size had become standard, it would have been interesting, because if the 24.5-inch diameter becomes standard, then when you are talking about submarine torpedoes and such, like where they don't need to be quite that long range the warhead size can immediately go up if you're using the same body. Um, Obviously, you could just make it shorter. (laughs) But, yeah, yeah, if they're using roughly the same body size, you're going to have fewer torpedoes, obviously. So instead of having um, quadruple and quintuple or pentad launchers, you might see triples and quadruples instead. The T-Class, sadly, will probably have to say goodbye to its 10 torpedo forward salvo and probably go with six or eight. And, of course, you're going to have for submarines fewer torpedoes because you can't fit as many of them aboard. Um, Destroyers doesn't make too much odds. I severely doubt there's going to be a 24.5-inch aerial torpedo. I think they're going to stick with the 18-inch on that particular metric. Now, as far as how much better or worse, I think, marginally speaking... The British would actually be better off because as assuming a relatively normal development cycle, as I said, you are probably going to be looking at torpedoes with a substantially bigger punch. And that in turn means that what hits are scored are going to do considerably more damage. Uh, so, for example, in the fight between Scharnhorst and Eisenhower versus Arden to Castor and Glorious, the British destroyers did manage to land a torpedo hit or two. And you'll see this story repeated 
in a number of other places uh, in both surface engagements and subsurface engagements, and of course in the engagement with Bismarck, where cruisers, destroyers, and submarines landed torpedo hits, which did damage, but the enemy ships were able to get away and repair. I have a feeling that if you took out, say, 40% of the fuel, bearing in mind that these are oxygen-enriched ones as well, uh, although not to quite to the extent that long lances were, but assuming that you took out, say, 40% of the fuel and you cut the range down and with the advances in torpedo motors during the interwar period, you end up with a, a weapon that can do about ten to 12,000 yards and you instead fill that space with explosive, so you're probably pushing half a ton of explosive if you want to be really generous, maybe slightly less. Those torpedoes will blow through practically any torpedo defense with with quite a bit of overkill to spare. So yeah, well the careers of the career of the Shan horse certainly may well have been cut short if uh a thousand pound plus torpedo warhead had suddenly connected with it in, in the middle of its takedown of Glorious. So yeah, I think overall the British forces might have been just that fraction better off. The loss of overall numbers of torpedoes on destroyers when they're firing full spreads is probably not going to make too much of a difference. And on submarines, although, as we said, there will be considerably fewer torpedoes, the simple fact of the matter is that the British submarine force didn't need the vast numbers of torpedoes that, say, something like a Type 7 or Type 9 U-boat might do in the Atlantic because there just wasn't that many targets for them to hunt outside of small operational theatres like the Mediterranean. I think the only area that might cause real problems will be on small submarines used in the Mediterranean, where, obviously, uh, being able to fit a very, very small number of torpedoes wouldn't be very good at all. And so we're on to Patreon questions. Brian Roper asks, Suppose the Japanese held off midway, held off on midway until the 3rd Carrier Division is repaired and their air groups have been re-strengthened. How do you see the battle playing out with the full Kido Butai, assuming the Americans are able to bring Saratoga and Wasp to bear as well? Would the Japanese have also utilised Hiyo given her late July commissioning date? It's a very difficult one to tell, to be honest. I don't think they would have used Hiyo mainly due to her slower speed. Um, the, the cargo was already slow enough without bringing them down further, given their, their, their desire for relatively swift operations. Now, as far as having um, Shikaku and Zuikaku there as well, and the Americans getting bringing Saratoga and Wasp into play, that's overall a net win for the Japanese. Um, I mean, Saratoga probably counterbalances one or the other, but Wasp, you know, Wasp for a Zuikaku, I, I think the Japanese are getting the better end of that deal. Now, it's very difficult to make any major assumptions without sort of re repeatedly wargaming out the situation, because Midway is such a minefield of what-ifs and lucky breaks. I mean, Hopefully, most people will be aware of the fact that sort of the the multiple squadrons of dive bombers showing up over the Japanese fleet when they did, as they did, and from the directions they did was largely down to a series of extraordinary coincidences. Um, some of which, almost if it wasn't reality, you would accuse of being completely implausible such as randomly following a Japanese destroyer back to its fleet. Um, and so trying to say, well, we're just adding extra aircraft to that situation. Well, the simple fact is by having those extra aircraft and those extra ships on both sides, it's not going to be the same situation. So, yeah, the, the Americans are going to have the advantage to a certain degree because obviously they still are going to retain their code breaking. Having more or fewer vessels isn't going to change that. So they're going to have a better idea of what they're getting into than the Japanese will. But on the other hand, the Japanese with six carriers, well, six fleet carriers present, are going to have a larger cap, and it's going to be more spread out, which means that uh, 
it's entirely possible that even if something vaguely similar to what historically did happen occurs when the American strike's coming in, there may well still be zeros unengaged at altitude who are ready to, to pounce on the incoming dive bombers and breaking up their attacks. So despite the greater um, number of American aircraft available and thus the larger attack wave, it might not actually accomplish as much as the historical one did. Or alternatively, the Japanese um, combat air patrol might all get diverted by the first few squadrons and then other squadrons come in unimpeded in a sort of slightly grander version of what did happen at Midway, but there's no real way to tell. Um, plus, of course, the Japanese were reconfiguring their aircraft after striking Midway itself, and, well, with two extra carrier groups there, you may have a situation of either the Japanese air assault might be large enough that they're not really going to need to restock and refuel for another land strike, or alternatively, they might decide to split their forces with two of their carriers or more being rigged for anti-shipping strikes at all times just in case, whilst the rest of them um, go after Midway itself. So yes, yeah, as, as I said, without without wargaming this out in extreme detail, it's impossible, I think, to realistically say how this would have gone definitively. It could have gone anything from, as we said, a, like a grander scale version of Midway, except now the Kido Butai is down all six of its original fleet carriers. Or it could equally go the other way, with multiple squadrons of combat air patrol zeros completely savaging the uh, early American attack, and then a combined Kido Butai flight uh, strike group. Or even if they lose one carrier, the rest of them all coming in, at which point, that's probably bad news for the U.S. Navy. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I'm I'm going to say qualified pass on that one as far as an outcome goes. Although, if if anyone wants to try and st start work on the on the vast amounts of uh, scenario building and paperwork that be necessary to wargame out accurately, let me know and I'll do what I can to help. Vinve asks, how much did World War II radar systems weigh, and how large were they physically? It seems counterintuitive that navies had to remove entire guns or gun systems to free up weight for installing them. Well, unfortunately, the answer is, again, one of these massively varying um, possibilities, because you have all sorts of different types of radar for all sorts of different purposes, and... Therefore, the weights can be all over the shop. I mean, you've got radars like this one, which have a relatively distinct mounting set, um, which could be put on a mast. You've also got other radars which have huge antennas or double antennas. that. So you could be looking at, for the radar, just the radar itself, so the emitter and receiver, you could be looking at something that's... 5, 10 feet across, or you could be looking at something that's 15, 20 or more feet across, or vertically as well. And then on top of that, you've got the various director systems that went with them, and those can be pretty darn heavy. Um, Bill Cunningham, in a response on the Patreon, points out that the Mark 37 radar director was well over f um, five tons just for the, the base unit itself. And once everything else had got in, the fittings to mount it, etc., you're talking over 10 tons. Now, in the context of, of a large sort of cruiser triple turret or a battleship uh, main gun turret, that might not sound too much, but you are talking in the weight range of a full secondary battery weapon. And crucially, it's not just one radar, and it's not just purely the weight or size, it's also about the location and the number. Um, because you would have a navigation radar, certainly later in the war with navigation radar, air search radar, gunfire director radar, possibly additional gunfire director radars for your secondary batteries, and possibly an additional primary uh, gun director radar, so one for one aft. Um, you might have backups to your general navigation and search radars. Um, some of your smaller guns might have their own individual radars, and so on and so forth. So even if 
an individual system might only weigh double digit tons, you might end up with several hundred tons of radar all over the ship, plus obviously the crew to man them, etc, etc. And on top of that, as I say, it's also about location, because a secondary battery or even a primary battery gun is going to be at main deck level or slightly higher. Radar by its nature generally is quite a lot higher in the ship, and that affects stability a heck of a lot more and has a much greater effect, therefore, on, on the ship. And so if you're talking about possibly over 100 tonnes of radar all mostly mounted relatively high in the ship, then you start to see why something like a cruiser might ditch a turret, which might weigh in the roughly the same order when it comes to overall mass, in order to accommodate both the weight and stability implications of these numerous radar sets. Bill Cunningham asks, The highest ranking admiral in American Navy history was Admiral Dewey, but who was, comparatively, the highest ranking admiral in the history of any nation? Well, Dewey was Admiral of the Navy, which is, uh, well, a one -off, so far, one-off rank in the US Navy equivalent to a British Admiral of the Fleet rank, which is in and of itself a very high high position. Um, so in NATO terms, this is a five-star rank. Comparatively, who was the highest, rank, highest ranking Admiral in the history of any nation? Well, at the moment, and generally speaking, the current holder of highest ranking Admiral in the history of any nation, uh, uh, excluding Admirals who for various reasons, were also political figures in charge of their countries, would have to be the gentleman, or indeed uh, the prince, who has been <laughs> gracing your screens for the past minute or two, and that is uh, His Royal Highness Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, who also, um, as of relatively recently, holds the rather wonderful title of Lord High Admiral of the Royal Navy which outranks an admiral of the fleet. So, yes, the, the Duke of Edinburgh, in addition to actually legitimately being worshipped as a god in certain areas of the world, is also a Lord High Admiral, and thus making him the highest-ranking admiral uh, of any nation, as far as I'm aware, as I, as I say, outside of where an admiral is somehow also a political figure. Andronor asks, if Admiral Dönitz was given the U-boats he'd asked for, or at least more than what he historically had, how much would it have affected the outcome in a war in the war against the UK and later on the USA? Could it have forced the UK surrender before the USA gets involved? Again, with a relatively open question like that, it's not really possible to say one way or the other for sure, because if he'd got 300 U-boats, that's very different to you say getting 150 or 200, although none of those would be good news. And it also depends on the kind of U-boats, because you could just magic up 300 Type 9s, and yeah, that would be pretty much game over for UK shipping, assuming they've got the crews to man them all. Um, well, and they fixed did some of the early issues with their torpedoes, but... It could equally be that maybe they build up to 200 U-boats, but most of that build-up beyond historical is coastal U-boats, because they're much quicker and easier to build, at which point, well, operating in the English Channel and in the North Sea is going to be substantially less fun than it was, but it's not going to affect the Atlantic War all that much. But at, at, the, sort of, at the upper end of this, the scale of this kind of question, then yes, it's possible that... I don't think necessarily a UK surrender, but certainly uh, the UK not doing anything like as much as it did historically um, in terms of things like resisting the invasion of Norway, um, the larger scale operations in the Mediterranean and the Indian Oceans. The UK would have had to pull in a lot more of its resources for convoy escorting if there were large numbers of Kriegsmarine fleet U-boats and long-range U-boats out in the Atlantic. The one saving grace for the Royal Navy might well be that, as was covered in the video on the Mark 14 briefly, the Germans were as badly affected with faulty magnetic detonators as anybody else in the early part of the war, so their torpedoes were less effective than they could have been, 
so that might allow the UK to hold out long enough for the US to come in, or to be perfectly honest, they, they might just have bought even more Clemsons, um, because a Clemsons are perfectly good destroyer for use on convoy escorts so yeah again it it runs the whole gamut it could run the gamut from slightly more dangerous to operate in coastal waters but otherwise everything's pretty much as is all the way up to literally everything is on fire and sinking <laughs> um so yeah we need a little bit more detail to determine exactly which scenario or well, between those two or something in between we're going to follow the Hand of Ray asks, I just rewatched the first dry dock ever done, specifically the pairing of HMS Warrior versus USS Monitor. You mentioned a book called Stars and Stripes Forever, and you said, and I quote, his naval research apparently seems to have been gazing lovingly at a picture of an American flag whilst a bald eagle scratches his eyes out. Hand of Ray continues, can you tell me what you meant by that? What particular scenes in the book made you describe it like that? Okay, so, yeah, my opinion of Harry Harrison as a historical or alternate historical author is somewhere down in my non-existent basement. To summarise, um, the hypothetical battle that he posits has the Monitor get pretty much as close as actually is shown in this bit of artwork um, before he describes the monitor s steaming to within a scant few feet before firing into the armoured battery thus in his own words punching the cannonballs through the armour plate to wreak havoc and destruction on the gun deck um, then sailing around to the stern of the warrior to destroy the means of propulsion okay whatever fine the problems will always start with the proposed location of the battle. Monitor is known, quite rightly, as a not particularly seaworthy ship. Warrior has a draft that means it's not able to enter the, the shallow coastal areas. Like anything with a water depth much below about 30 feet is probably not a safe area to take a warrior into. The battle, according to Harry Harrison, takes place off of Ship Island. And, well, for those of you in America who uh, know where that is, you'll know, and for the rest of you I'm going to tell you, the waters around that area are considerably shallower than that. So we've already hypothesized magical flying warrior at this point. Um, because he physically can't get there. I mean, more to the point... I, given where Ship Island is relative to where Monitor was built and deployed, it's fairly doubtful Monitor could get there without sinking either, but there you go. So the fight is already taking place in an area where neither ship is either likely or in some one case physically possible for it to be. But then when you look into it further, um, Warrior's speed is, when it's combined using speed, uh, steam and sail, is over three times that of Monitor. Yes, it's not the world's most agile warship, but Monitor, neither is Monitor. Um, the fact that Monitor's turning circle is smaller than Warrior's is due to, purely to the fact that Monitor is travelling so much slower than Warrior. In terms of actual turning time, Warrior can do a 180 much faster than Monitor can. Um, and sort of, yeah, the, the litany goes on. Armour-wise armor and armament-wise, Warrior has more guns, um, the 110 pounders are not the world's best guns. They have a, a disturbing habit of springing their breech blocks at people. Um, but the 68 pounders firing steel shot at close range, and to most of the 110 pounders, assuming they're working, are more than capable of doing severe damage to monitor, if not necessarily punching through straight off. They can certainly do cumulative damage and wreck the wreck the ship, assuming they hit it. Monitor's only real saving grace is it's quite a small target. Um, but then Virginia managed to hit it, so I'm pretty sure <laughs> Warrior with significantly more guns <clears throat> and more high-velocity guns definitely can do. And as, as was addressed in the video we did on Hampton Roads, the 11-inch muzzle loaders at this point, they no, they're not using half charges, they're using the recommended charges um, as described by their manufacturer and as issued by the US Navy, those charges cannot penetrate the armour of Warrior, and this was actually tested in various gun tests, they can't actually penetrate the ship even at point-blank range. Um, now, fair enough, 
if they're using the increased charges from later in the war, once they discover that the 11 inch Dahlgrens are actually much stronger than they'd initially thought, then yeah, at absolute point blank range, an 11 inch gun would be able to punch through Warrior's armour. However, in shocking news, if you sail right up to HMS Warrior, it's in a monitor in the USS Monitor, its guns are going to be able to punch straight through straight back. Um, which again, it's got more guns than you do. And they fire considerably faster than uh, monitors, and that's assuming that monitors turret hasn't decided to go on a on a carousel mission like it, again it did at Hampton Roads. And once again, we as we said before, warriors so much faster, it has no reason to let monitor get that close. It can quite easily take monitor apart from a range that even with its with the late war increased charges, monitor still can't hurt it. And if monitor does get that close, well. There's a huge number of cutlasses and pistols on board Warrior. If one is dumb enough to get that close, they'll just end a boarding party and add it to the Royal Navy's co fleet collection for about as long as it takes for a bad storm to blow up. Um, then you've got the the last bit, um, which is the going going around the stern to destroy the means means of propulsion. How the the ship has a fully enclosed citadel including bulkheads made up of the same armor material as is on the sides if, if monitor goes around the stern it can't fire into the engines it's got to it's got to still deal with that armored citadel and the propeller shaft and propeller shockingly enough are below the water line and monitor as guns are pretty much at the water line already they don't have a tr tremendous degree of um down angle so yeah, the idea that th this battle would in any way go down the way that Harrison suggests is basically laughable, even in optimal conditions, and even if we relocate it to a position where actually both ships are physically capable of approaching each other, Warrior has every capability of just effectively kiting Monitor at, say, 500 yards, and just going, yeah, well, fine, shoot the unarmored ends all you like, it's not actually going to affect the warrior's fighting capability in any significant way meanwhile the 68 and 110 pounder shots are going to batter the thing into submission in a relatively decent clip um i mean to give you some idea of the difference of rate of fire you've got two guns aboard monitor averaging a shot every six to ten minutes whereas the broadside of warrior is going to be 15 plus guns firing about once a minute the sheer weight of fire apart from anything else is on warrior side and on top of that we also have notes from warrior's first captain about how he planned to engage an enemy ironclad although he was writing about the french gloire and this is basically exactly the tactics he wrote that he was going to use sail into his preferred range fire away and keep firing away and use superior speed to stay at that range until the enemy is willing to give up so yes that none of this is particularly difficult to find either um and so this is why harrison's account of the battle is basically just complete and utter fantasy and with that blast from the past out of the way uh, that brings us to the end of a dry dock episode 82. So thank you very much for listening and I hope to see you again in another video.